O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's ask God's blessing on our worship in silent prayer. Our help is in the name of Jehovah, who made heaven and earth. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing from Psalter 245. And we sing the first three stanzas of 245. We worship God by taking heed to his law. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee 
out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The Lord Jesus summarized this law, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We sing from Psalter 51. The three stanzas of 51.
Let us worship God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we come together as a congregation of believers to praise and thank Thee for the great miracle which Thou didst perform some 2,000 years ago in raising Thy Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. This is a marvel. This is a wonder, a miracle of Thy grace. For we know that death comes to all men, and death is the great enemy, and death is judgment for sin, for man sinned, and death came into the world, and death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And death does not let go of its victims, but holds them fast. But death was not able to hold our Lord Jesus Christ. He died. He died a horrible death from many points of view, and especially he died under thy wrath and curse because he was the sin bearer. He took upon himself our sin and guilt and shame, and he was buried so that his death was very apparent to all those who were there at the time. And his death filled his disciples with sorrow and confusion and perplexity because they did not expect him to die. He lay in the tomb, the cold, dark, gloomy, miserable tomb. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. This, O Father, is a wonder of grace. And it shows us that his death on the cross was acceptable to thee. It shows us that he did indeed make full satisfaction for all of our sins. And his death proves to us that he is the living Lord Jesus, who is now in heaven at thy right hand, ruling over all things. We thank thee that he did not remain in the tomb. And if he had remained in the tomb, then we would have no reason for gathering together. There would be no gospel. There would be no good news for sinners. There would be no forgiveness of sins, no victory over death, no Christian church. And we would be miserable because we would still be in our sins and under condemnation. And so we thank Thee for His resurrection, and we thank Thee that we can come together to remember His resurrection. We do that every week, because we gather on the first day of the week, which was the day on which He rose from the dead, And we do that in a special way on this particular Sunday as we remember what he did for us in rising from the dead. We thank thee, O Father, that because he rose from the dead, he is able from his position in heaven to pour out upon us all of the 
heavenly blessings and graces which are necessary for us to live as believers in the midst of this world that he poured out upon the church on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit dwells in the church from generation to generation. The Holy Spirit works mightily in the hearts of thy elect people, regenerating them, giving them that life which Jesus purchased for them on the cross and made manifest in his resurrection. That Holy Spirit who takes the preaching of the gospel, which would otherwise be a dead letter and empty words from a mere man. He takes that preaching, those words of the gospel, and he applies them mightily to the hearts of the hearers so that those who are thy people in the midst of the audience hear not only with the ears, but also with the heart and believe and receive that word. The Holy Spirit also sanctifies us. He separates us more and more from sin. He breaks within us that power and dominion and bondage of sin. And he consecrates us in love to thee, our God, so that we begin to live a new and holy life. Without the cross, without the resurrection, without the ascension into heaven and the sitting of Christ at thy right hand, these things would never happen. We thank thee for them. We thank thee that we can gather together as a congregation of believers and our children, and we pray that as we hear thy word this day, that thou wouldst bless us with understanding and with a willingness to put into practice the things that we learn. We pray, keep us from evil. We live in an evil, wicked world a world that is very quickly filling up the cup of its iniquity so that we are amazed and astounded by the development of sin that we see in society all around us. We pray, O oh Father, that thou will keep us from the evil one and keep us from the evil world. Keep us, O oh Father, from loving the world and from turning away from Thee and from indulging ourselves in the lusts and pleasures that are offered to us by this wicked world. Preserve our young people and children also, as they are also under assault. We thank Thee for good Christian homes, where they can be instructed and protected. We thank thee for the good Christian schools where they can be instructed as well. Bless those schools, O Father. Provide teachers to instruct the young people and children. Bless the instruction that is given. May it be faithful instruction. May it be glorifying to thee, may it be edifying to the students, and use it, O oh Father, to build up our children and young people in the faith of Jesus Christ. We pray for our office bearers. We thank thee for them. We thank thee that thou hast given them wisdom and understanding, that thou hast given them understanding of the scriptures and a desire to grow in that understanding. 
that thou hast given them love for us, love for thee, and love for the body of Christ, which is manifested in this place. We pray for our pastor as he brings the word to us each week. Give unto him what he stands in need of as he studies thy word and as he seeks to bring the fruit of that study to us from this pulpit. Give him the ability to present that word to us in a way that is easy for us to understand, in a way that is faithful to the truth of thy word, in a way that glorifies thy holy name. For all the glory must go to thee, and none of the glory may go to us, for we are but sinners. We are saved by thy grace. We have contributed nothing to that salvation which thou hast wrought for us. In Jesus Christ thou didst send thy Son, didst cause him to die upon the cross, didst raise him from the dead. All of these works are thine. We contributed nothing to them. And even the application of all of those benefits is thy work as well. As thou dost work in us faith and repentance and all of the other graces of salvation. Forgive, O Father, our sins, our many weaknesses and infirmities, impute them not to us, but put them away. And may we know that thou art our God who loves us, and may thy favor rest upon us for the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. We worship the Lord with our offerings for the general and benevolence funds.
We sing from Psalter 29, which speaks about Christ's resurrection from the dead. Let's sing the three stanzas of 29. We read God's word in the gospel according to John, in chapters 19 and 20. Beginning in chapter 19, verse 38, through chapter 20, verse 10, our text is verses 1 through 10 of chapter 20. John 19, beginning at verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, 
and we know not where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Thus far we read God's holy word. Beloved, on the first day of the week following Jesus' crucifixion, there was much activity around Jesus' tomb, and the chief visitors that morning were certain women. And the four gospel accounts describe these women and vary in some of the details concerning these women, but, beloved, that is not a contradiction. The four evangelists describe the same event, but they do so from different perspectives. Matthew mentions two women. Mark mentions three Luke mentions three women plus other women, so at least five women. And John, he focuses on only one woman, Mary Magdalene. But clearly there were others with her because she says, we know not where they have laid him. And these women, and Mary Magdalene in particular, these women had come not to witness a resurrection that was very far from their minds, but to anoint a dead body. This would be their last labor of love performed upon a dearly departed Savior. But before these women ready risen from the dead, he was no longer descended from heaven and had removed the stone from before the tomb or the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene sees this. And so, of course, do the other women. Mary Magdalene sees this, and she jumps to a conclusion. Someone must have stolen the body. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. And having seen this, Mary Magdalene rushes away, leaving the other women at the tomb. The other women then meet the angel, and later on they meet Jesus himself. Mary Magdalene, she runs away to find help, and she comes to Peter and John and reports to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. The tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was gone, but the tomb was not quite empty. It was nearly empty. There was something there. 
Notice then the mystery of the nearly empty tomb. The mystery of the nearly empty tomb. First, reported by Mary Magdalene. Second, investigated by Peter and John. And third, evidence of the resurrection. Mary Magdalene and the other women, according to the other gospel accounts, saw the stone taken away from the sepulcher, verse 1. And to understand the significance of that in Mary's mind, consider what these women had witnessed. Quite simply, Mary Magdalene and the other women had witnessed Jesus' burial. That's clear from the other accounts Matthew 27, 61, and there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Mark 15, 47, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. And Luke 23, 55, and the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid. They had witnessed the burial of Jesus. First, they witnessed the removal of Jesus' body from the cross. Luke 23, 53 and 54, this man, Joseph of Arimathea, went unto Pilate, and begged the body of Jesus and took it down. Jesus' body was the body of a man who had been crucified. He was now dead. Joseph then removed the nails from Jesus' hands and feet. He carefully took that broken, bloodied, pierced body down from the cross, perhaps he made some attempt to wipe away some of the congealed blood, and he prepared that body for burial. Second, these women witnessed the arrival of Nicodemus carrying with him a large quantity of spices. John 19, 39, Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And myrrh and aloes are sweet-smelling powders. One is a resin from a tree, and the other is powdered wood, something like sawdust. And myrrh can also be used in liquid form. Notice how much of this myrrh and aloes Nicodemus brought. A hundred pound weight. And that's about 75 U.S. pounds in weight, or 34 kilograms. That's a lot of spice. Compare that to John 12, verse 3, where Mary, another Mary, anointed Jesus with one pound of spikenard, and that was worth, according to the estimation of Judas Iscariot, that was worth a year's salary. And the Jews on average would use between one and five pounds for a burial. Nicodemus brings 100 pounds. Enough to bury a king with royal honors. And some commentators estimate that the value of 100 pounds, 100 Roman pounds of these spices would be about $200,000. $200,000. And as far as the weight goes, well, Think of the average weight of an 11-year-old boy. That's about 70 pounds. Or think of a five-pound bag of flour, 15 of those. Or 
It's the weight of about 40 psalters. So it's a lot of spice. And imagine the smell of all of this spice. Have you ever been to the spice cupboard in your kitchen and spilled some spice, let's say cinnamon, on your fingers or on your clothes? Well, imagine 75 pounds of cinnamon spilled all over your kitchen or poured over your clothes. This was spice designed to cover up the smell of rotting flesh prepared for Jesus' burial. Third, they witnessed the wrapping of Jesus' body in linen clothing. Matthew 27, 59, And when Joseph had taken the body and wrapped it in a linen clean cloth. Mark 15, 46, And he bought, or he purchased, fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen. The evangelists, Matthew and Mark, as well as Luke, describe one cloth a shroud or a burial cloth made from fine linen. John adds this detail in John 19, verse 40, Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes, plural, with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury So think of that one linen cloth or shroud being torn into strips and then used to wrap up Jesus' body. And imagine Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus taking handfuls of these spices and pouring them over the body and then taking the linen strips and wrapping them around the various parts of the body, the torso, the legs, the arms, and then repeating that process over and over with layers of spices and layers of strips of linen until all the spices and all the linen are used up and the body is completely enveloped. And then there was a separate napkin for his head. Chapter 20, verse 7 says, a separate cloth for Jesus' head or face, wrapped around his head, perhaps like a turban, or covering his face, and perhaps too with spices added there as well. And fourth, they witnessed the securing of the tomb. Matthew 27, 60, and he ruled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And so the women saw the tomb and they saw the stone and they saw where Jesus was laid. And so as they come on that first morning, that first Easter morning, they voice their concerns as they are approaching the tomb. They say in Mark 16, verse 3, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And perhaps they also saw, although this is unlikely, they also saw perhaps the further securing of the tomb, because in Matthew 27, the chief priests and the Pharisees requested a guard to guard Jesus' tomb, which Pilate grants them. Matthew 27, 66, they made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. A watch there is a company of soldiers to guard the tomb. They saw Jesus' body being removed from the cross. They saw him being anointed with spices, wrapped in linen, and secured in a tomb with a stone rolled over the entrance of the tomb. And then soldiers were stationed outside of that tomb. From these facts, we can draw a number of conclusions which help us refute some of the common objections to the resurrection offered by skeptics. 
First, from these facts we notice, Jesus was really dead. Jesus was really dead. One theory proposed by skeptics in the history of the church is the swoon theory, the theory that Jesus did not really die. He simply swooned or fainted on the cross, became unconscious on the cross, and then later he revived and appeared to his disciples as if he had resurrected. And somehow the disciples believed that he had risen from the dead and began to preach that he had risen from the dead. But he didn't really die. That's the point. But that's absurd. Jesus really died. The Roman soldiers who were experts in execution knew that Jesus died, and they checked to make sure that he died, and they pierced his side with a spear to make sure that he died, and blood and water came out of his side. And Joseph and Nicodemus were also sure that Jesus died. They took down his lifeless body from the cross, they wrapped his cold corpse in linen and spices, and they placed him in a tomb, and they rolled a stone against it, and the soldiers guarded it, and no one thought, he's not really dead after all. And Jesus did not wake up during any of that process of being removed from the cross and covered in spices and wrapped in linen and put into a tomb. And even if he had not really died and had simply woken up from a swoon, how would he have had the strength to release himself from the grave clothes, escape from the tomb, and then convince his disciples that he had gloriously risen from the dead? The whole theory of the swoon theory is absurd. Second, the women did not go to the wrong tomb on that morning. Another theory of the skeptics is that the women must have gone to the wrong tomb in the dark and come to the wrong conclusion that Jesus had risen from the dead. That too is impossible because the women watched the whole burial process and observed where Jesus was buried. And even if they had gone to the wrong tomb, Peter and John would not have made the same mistake. Third, the resurrection is not a psychological trick. Some have suggested that if you earnestly expect something enough, you can convince yourself that it really is happened. And so psychologically, you convince yourself that Jesus rose again from the dead. But the disciples did not expect it to happen. It was a complete surprise to them. That's very striking in the resurrection accounts in the Gospels. None of his followers expected him to rise again. They should have but they didn't. He had told them that he would, but they had forgotten or misunderstood what he had meant by this. Why do these women observe the burial of Jesus? It's not because they expect a resurrection, but it's because they want to know where the body is because they want to finish the job of anointing their dead friend after the Jewish Sabbath is over. And so in Luke 24, verse 1, we find these women, quote, bringing the spices which they had prepared. You don't bring spices if you expect a resurrection. 
And therefore, when Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had been taken away or had been rolled away from the tomb of Jesus, she reached only one conclusion, a wrong conclusion. Her conclusion was not this, Hallelujah, the Lord Jesus has risen from the dead just as he promised. That's not her conclusion. When she sees the stone has been removed, she fears the worst. And in so doing, she echoes the sentiments of the other women. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we, speaking for the other women, we know not where they have laid him. Who are the they? She does not say. But clearly she suspects that they are enemies of her beloved Lord Jesus. They are not Jesus' disciples or Jesus' friends. They are grave robbers, or maybe they are the Pharisees and chief priests. They have taken away the Lord. And so Mary, frantic with worry and filled with dismay, flees, runs to find Peter and John. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. And how absurd are those words? They have taken away the Lord Really, Mary, the Lord? They have taken away the Lord? But grief makes us say and do and think absurd things. On hearing Mary Magdalene's news, Peter and John rush off to investigate. It's striking that they both ran. Running is not common in the Bible. From a practical point of view, it means you have to gird up your loins by tucking your long flowing garment into your belt so you don't trip. But running was necessary that morning because of the urgency. They wanted to see for themselves what had happened. Is Mary telling them the truth? Is it really true that they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher? In verse 4 we read, So they, that is Peter and John, ran both together, and the other disciple, that's John, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. We're not told why John runs faster than Peter, and why John therefore gets to the tomb first. Some have said that perhaps Peter was dragging his feet because he was afraid, given that he had denied Jesus, but that's very unlikely. Otherwise, why would he have run at all? The simplest and easiest explanation is that John was younger and fitter than Peter was. They're both zealous. They're both keen to be there. They both love the Lord. But John, because he's younger and fitter, he gets there first. John arrives there first, before Peter. But then notice the behavior of these two men at the tomb. It's different. And this shows us that they have very different personalities which fits with how they are described elsewhere in Scripture, which fits with the fact that this is an eyewitness account by John himself. It also tells us that not all Christians are the same. We ought not judge one another because of our different personalities and reactions to things. Some believers are quiet, and they like to think and contemplate things, 
John was like that. Other believers are more active and impetuous. Peter was like that. But both kinds of believers are members of Christ's church and should be valued and cherished as fellow saints. John arrives first, but he does not enter the tomb. Instead, verse 5 tells us, he, stooping down and looking in, saw. The Greek word saw there has the idea of to glance at or to take a peep. So John bent over, had a quick look, but did not enter the tomb. Then Peter arrives in second place, but he is not satisfied with a quick glance. He went into the sepulcher, verse 6, and seeth. And there the Greek word see is a different word. It means to gaze upon, to stare at, to look intently at, and to examine with the eyes and the mind. So Peter does not simply take a glance at what's happening in the tomb, but his eyes and his heart drink it all in. And finally then, John, following Peter's lead, he enters the tomb as well, verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher and saw. So, John has a quick glance. Then Peter arrives. He goes in. He looks very carefully. And then John follows Peter in, and he looks too. We're not told why Peter barged into the tomb while John waited outside. Perhaps John, out of deference for Peter's age, waited for Peter to take the lead. But again, it shows us the two characters or personalities of these men. And we would have expected this very behavior by understanding what these men are like elsewhere in the Gospels. Think of chapter 21. John there, as Jesus stands by the shore and calls to his disciples, John there is the first to recognize Jesus it is the Lord, chapter 21, verse 7. But Peter is the first one to take action. He girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. Here, Peter takes action, walks in, looks at everything. John is content initially just to have a quick look and does not go in. And so both men eventually go inside the tomb, and they see the same thing. They see a nearly empty tomb. They see what Mary Magdalene had said. The Lord is not in the tomb. It's empty because the main thing, the body of Jesus, is not there. It's nearly empty because something else is there. Something has been left behind, and so it's a nearly empty tomb. Mary Magdalene is right. The rolled away stone indicated that Jesus was not in the tomb. But Mary's conclusion is wrong. They have taken him away. That was wrong. And if Mary had looked into the tomb, and not simply run away as she did, if she had looked into the tomb, she would have seen what Peter and John saw. Jesus' grave clothes. In verse 5, with a quick glance, John saw the linen clothes 
lying. And those clothes refer to those strips of linen which Joseph and Nicodemus had wrapped around the body of Jesus in multiple layers with the spices. In verse 6, Peter examines the same thing. He seeth the linen clothes lie. And then Peter sees something else, verse 7, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. In other words, there were two parts to these linen or to these grave clothes. There was the part for the body, and there was a separate part for the head. And that fits also with what we know from Lazarus in John 11, verse 44. He was buried the same way. And he that was dead, Lazarus, came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him Go. So John and Peter notice the absence of the body of Jesus, but the presence of the grave clothes of Jesus. And this fact proves that Mary Magdalene is mistaken in her conclusion. Thieves did not steal. Jesus' body. We know that for a number of reasons. First, thieves would first have had to gain entrance to the tomb in order to steal his body. We've seen already how secure that tomb was. It was hewn out of solid rock, a large stone was placed at the entrance, and it was guarded by soldiers. And who had a motive to steal the body? Well, not common thieves, because Jesus was not rich. He was not a target for common thieves. And not Jesus' enemies, because they were the ones who had insisted on having a guard at the tomb. And so why would they take away the body? And if they had, let's say, taken away the body, they could easily have produced that body when the disciples sometime later began preaching that he rose again from the dead. And besides that, they themselves had bribed the soldiers to lie about the disappearance of Jesus' body. Why then would they have taken the body for which they had secured a guard? And not Jesus' disciples either, because if they had taken the body, they would have known that the resurrection was a lie, a lie made up by themselves. And who risks suffering and death for an obvious lie? Second, the grave robber's theory falls apart because of factors of time and money. Thieves do not linger at the scene of the crime. If they had stolen the body, they would have carried it out in its grave clothes and not taken the time to unwrap the body and leave the grave clothes behind because the longer a thief stays at the scene of the crime, the greater likelihood there is of him being caught. And besides that, what thief steals only a body? And the body of one who at his death had no earthly possessions. And what thief then leaves behind linen, which is expensive, expensive fine linen, 
and also leaves behind a hundred weight of expensive spices, which we saw already was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Much easier and much more lucrative for greedy thieves to take the body, carry it away, unwrap it later, and then retrieve the linen and the spices in order to sell them. And third, the orderliness of the scene makes it impossible that his disappearance be the work of grave robbers. If grave robbers had stuck around to unwrap the body, which, as we have seen, they would not have done, the scene would not have appeared as Peter and John found it. Think of the scene of a burglary where someone robs a house. Thieves always leave behind a mess. They ransack a house looking for valuables. They don't tidy up after themselves. But Peter and John find the grave clothes lying neatly in one place, and they find the napkin that covered his head lying neatly in a separate place. Thieves did not do that. In fact, thieves could not do that. And those words lying and wrapped together do not mean strewn everywhere or dumped unceremoniously on the ground. There is order and method here. And so Mary Magdalene's conclusion, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him, simply does not fit the facts as Peter and John find them. What happened then on that early first day of the week in Jesus' tomb? How do we explain the scene that John and Peter found when they came to examine the tomb? Quite simply, this, beloved, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus, who had been crucified, rose again from the dead. That's the miracle and the mystery of the resurrection. No one, not Mary Magdalene, not Peter, not John, not the other disciples, not the other women, no one witnessed the resurrection itself. Peter and John witnessed the aftermath, the evidence left behind. Others met angels who announced to them the resurrection of Jesus. Mary Magdalene and the other women and Peter and John and others saw the resurrected Jesus after he rose from the dead, but no one actually witnessed the event itself. Instead of that, Jesus' tomb, before the earliest visitors arrived, was already empty of his body. Jesus rose bodily from the dead, and the grave clothes testify to this. We ought not think of Jesus lying there dead, and then his soul re-enters his body in the resurrection, and then he sits up and begins to unwrap himself and to escape from those linen bonds. That's not what happened. Jesus' body simply passed through the grave clothes, leaving them in that position, so that they retained the shape of his body and his head, and the weight of the spices helped those clothes retain their shape. 
Nor did Jesus then throw away the stone or burst out of the tomb, but he simply passed through the walls of the tomb as he had passed through the grave clothes. And then after the resurrection took place and Jesus was already gone from the tomb, the angel removed the stone, not to release him, but to reveal that the tomb was empty so that the women and Peter and John and others could testify to its emptiness or its nearly emptiness. And the resurrection then, beloved, is proof that Jesus, by his death on the cross, has accomplished our salvation. Without the resurrection, the cross is a tragedy. Without the resurrection, the cross is a failure. A dead Jesus who remains dead is not the Savior. Remember what the cross was. Jesus died on the cross under the wrath and curse of God because he was bearing our sins. And if he did not rise from the dead, we can conclude only one thing. Jesus, by his death on the cross, did not accomplish our salvation, did not accomplish the necessary righteousness and obedience for our salvation, and did not make satisfaction for our sins. But the resurrection is God's seal of approval on the cross. By the resurrection, God says, my son has paid the price in full, and I have accepted that price. And therefore, on the basis of what he has done, I declare you to be justified. I forgive your sins. Therefore, we are glad that Mary Magdalene was wrong. They have not taken away the Lord from the sepulcher. He is risen from the dead. And we are glad that Mary Magdalene and the other women did not find the dead body that they wanted to anoint because he is risen from the dead. He has no need of anointing spices. He is the resurrected Lord of glory. And what then did Peter and John make of all of this? They enter the tomb. They look at the evidence. What was their reaction? Well, they had two different reactions. Luke 24, 12 tells us, then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Peter wondered, which means he marveled or he was amazed. He is trying in his own mind to make sense of what he has seen. What does this mean? The body is not there. The grave clothes are left behind. Something has happened. Something miraculous and supernatural and wonderful has happened. God has done something. But what does it all mean? He did not yet believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, and he kept his confused thoughts to himself. John's assessment, verse 8, he saw and believed. John was already a believer, as of course was Peter. But this means that John saw the evidence in the tomb and he believed in the resurrection. He believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. 
not because he saw Jesus, he would see him later, not because of the testimony of the women who saw Jesus, he would believe their testimony later as well, not even on the testimony of Scripture, because verse 9 says, for as yet they knew not the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead, not on the testimony of Jesus himself, which he had forgotten or misunderstood. Remember, Christ had said multiple times he would rise again from the dead. But John believed because of the evidence of the nearly empty tomb. The absence of Jesus' body and the position of the grave clothes convinced him that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. And we believe that too. We believe that Jesus rose again from the dead. We believe that on the basis of Scripture and all of the testimonies in God's Word concerning this wonderful and amazing event. And through believing, we have eternal life. Amen. Our Father in heaven, what a wonder of grace it is that Jesus, our Savior, rose again from the dead, that his sacrifice on the cross was not in vain for us, but was accepted by thee, and because of his sacrifice on the cross, we are accepted by thee as well. Work in our hearts, O oh Father, a firm conviction concerning this truth, that our Lord Jesus Christ rose again on the third day. And may that be for us the reason for our joy and gladness in this day. For Christ's sake, amen. We sing the five stanzas of Psalter 77, verse 5. My grief is turned to gladness, to thee my thanks I raise, who hast removed my sorrow and girded me with praise. And now no longer silent, my heart thy praise will sing, O Lord my God forever, my thanks to thee I bring. The five stanzas of 77.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you all. Amen.